what is the goal of the United States in providing all of this lethal aid, all of this milita militarized support? Is it really to just to protect the eastern flank of Ukraine? Do we really believe it's an attempt by Russia to reestablish the Soviet Union when I've, I've written and spoken for probably nearly two decades that the evidence, I'm sorry, just really doesn't support that as a true objective of the Russian Federation, that they intend to retake all of Eastern Europe and reformulate some type of Soviet Union slash Eastern Bloc. So if that's not true and, they, and Americans won't believe that protecting the Eastern part of Ukraine is a worthwhile goal, for that much money and for that much sacrifice, what is the goal? What is the goal of the United States in doing what it's doing? And, and that's when thing, that's when the conversation starts to turn really, really interesting and makes a lot of people start to get a little uncomfortable in good ways, in yeah. thinking thoughts and new, new perspectives. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm joined today again by Dr. Matthew Croston, who is an accomplished international security scholar at Bowie State University, um, and he's also a Russia specialist. He studied modern uh, Russian geopolitics and has been an adamant critic of the way America and the West in general uh, have been portraying Russia's history, motivations, and geostrategic predicaments at uh, the moment, and he has also been um, trying to interpret America's uh, reactions to Russia and the Ukraine war. And I talked to Matthew about a year ago, and I think it's time for an update. So, Matthew, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Pascal. Always a pleasure talking with you. Um, Matthew, you gave several interviews, and you've also written pieces over the entire year of this uh, horrible war that's going on. And you told me in an email exchange that there are things that haven't been said yet, and that you want would like to put out there. What is that? I think the easiest thing, especially with that great introduction you just gave me, so thank you, was that if if there's a source of my frustration over the last year, because I remember when we spoke. Uh, here we are a year a year later. When we were speaking a year ago, we we were really just purely speculating, right? Like we we weren't really sure how things were going to go, and we weren't yet aware of just how active the Americans were going to be in terms of uh, intervening in this war without physical troops on the ground. Nor were we actually aware that how much that intervention would actually have a huge impact on outcomes in this war. And, and we couldn't have anticipated it. I don't even think if, you, if, if I'm being honest, and if you can now get, and it's, this is very difficult to do in Washington, DC, if you can get anyone who will now go back in hindsight and say, oh yeah, I had no idea this was going to happen. I didn't realize Ukraine would do that well or Russia would perform that poorly. They all act like they knew that now. Mm. And, I, I, and you and I both know a year ago when we spoke, we did not think that way. We, we did not think that Russia would perform that poorly. We did not think Ukraine could perform that well for that long. And we really didn't know or understand or have a good imagination of how much all of this lethal aid that has come from the United States into Ukraine, and not just sort of giving them weapons, it's been giving them weapons with an awful lot of advisory capacity to train them mm -hmm. So that they use these weapon systems as expertly as the Americans themselves, and that to me has been uh, extremely frustrating to realize how few people seem to understand that on the street level in the West, because most of them just say it's really, really a hard push in the media in terms of the brave Ukrainians, like they're all Arnold Schwarzeneggers and Sylvester Stallone's from the old days, action movie heroes. They're so so brave and heroic. And I commend them for what they do. There's no doubt about that. Their country was invaded, and so they're defending themselves. But the big elephant in the room for me is the fact that they could not have performed this way without the lethal aid that was given to them. I forgot who said that, but somebody pointed out at the moment, we basically have a NATO army staffed with Ukrainians fighting in Ukraine. <laughs> uh, because even the HIMAR systems, you cannot launch HIMAR uh, rock, uh, the missiles without the OK from 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 the west and the the with the, the targeting the targeting doesn't work without the actual uh, um surveillance right. from the west so you need you need this very close cooperation 
And it's and it's interesting to me that another area that we don't talk about now, because of the the way this war, the way we look at this war has changed over the last year. And when when we started to realize in the West that, oh, this because I think the most liberal interpretations one year ago were that, well, uh, we might be able to help the Ukrainians a little bit. We might be able to inflict some damage on, on, on the Russian forces, but eventually they're going to overrun the territory or overrun Ukrainian forces. And we're not going to put boots on the ground in Ukraine ever, no matter what. So we'll never be supplementing Ukrainian losses. So ultimately this is going to eventually peter out and Russia is going to achieve whatever it is that Russia is trying to achieve in Ukraine. We weren't entirely clear about that a year ago. And as the time moved forward, there's almost become this sort of bloodthirst on the part of Americans by seeing how successful their systems are in killing Russians, right? Like the Russians absolutely perform incredibly poorly. And, I, and Russia has always had a bit of a history of overestimating its prowess overestimating the morale of its troops. And they've always had the confidence that, well, even if we lose a lot of people, we always have more to give. And there's always a willingness to sacrifice in historical terms for in Russian wartime. That might be different for the Ukraine conflict, but I know that was certainly a, a, mili a Russian military attitude when this war began, when this special military op operation began. And the Americans have just suddenly become obsessed by the idea of, well, Russia, for whatever reason, Russia is not calling us out in terms of trying to escalate the war to us directly, even though we're providing all these weapon systems and all this training, and we're helping the Ukrainians accomplish these defensive goals that are almost now turning into offensive ones. And as long as the Russians aren't going to call us out for it, we're just going to keep doing it. And well, I'm, well, I mean, the, 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 Rus the Russians do repeatedly say this is a war. I mean, we're basically, we are in a conflict with NATO. They've Absolutely. been saying that from the beginning, right? That's why they made the, the uh, in December in 2021, they sent these treaties over to Washington and to Brussels, not even to Kiev, in order to discuss Ukrainian, I mean, uh, the, the security yeah. structure. <laughs> I mean, they look at this right. as, a, as, a, uh, as a contest with NATO. And maybe one thing I just want to, I would like to add to this, we also see the strategy, the strategic change. At the beginning, I think Russia's uh, objective was to reach where they were end of March, which was a negotiated settlement to their blitzkrieg kind of that they that they drove it. They were all the way up to Kiev, and then that completely crumbled down, and the overextension uh, wrecked them. And then, and now we've got for like nine months or so this kind of uh, trench warfare that we're seeing <laughs> again. Absolutely, no, absolutely, and I, and I think part of that has been fueled. I find it interesting that th there's a there's a subtle difference. In something you just said, Pascal, that I, I think always gets missed here is that while Russia has always been very quick from the very beginning, that this is a proxy war, where this is a NATO war we're having to fight. We may not be fighting Americans physically on the ground, but we're fighting their weapons and their systems and their training. But yet those criticisms also haven't turned into actions and initiatives on the Russian side directly against Americans. And I, and I find that fascinating. It, it's in any other situation, but because of the way we sort of uniquely look at Russia as sort of uh, the eternal adversary, and therefore we will not capitalize on opportunities for peace, how can that not be in any other situation that would have been looked at as a sign of restraint on, a par on the part of the invading force, that they see it as a proxy war, they see it as your America making the, the people we've invaded you're helping them be stronger than they should be. You're helping them achieve successes where they shouldn't be achieving successes. So we actually should be having a problem with you, United States. We should have a right, therefore, to escalate this into a conflagration with you and your objectives and your forces. And Russia hasn't simply hasn't done it. Now, that's an opportunity there. <laughs> There's an opportunity there that we've just totally, like, we don't care. We don't care about that opportunity.
And yeah, there have been there have been like, hundreds of opportunities either to scale down this war, like in uh, end, end of March, and it's pretty clear by now that it was the Western side that told Kiev, "Don't do it, don't sign anything. <laughs> um, we're going to continue this. You're going to win." There's the whole rhetoric of escalation and also winning back, you know, even uh, Crimea. Anyone who says like win back Crimea is basically saying we need an outright war with. Uh, um, with Russia and NATO, and it's like basically like calling for a no-fly zone. You know, no-fly zone is right. code for full-blown NATO-Russia war, uh, because that's yes. what it would imply, right? Um, and the the Russians, it, that's why I believe them when they say that they don't look at the West as enemies. They that they just are afraid that they are genuinely afraid that the next thing, um, either they fight in Ukraine or they fight at home. I believe that they believe that, even if I don't approve of that. I don't approve right. of taking your defense to other countries. That's the root of all evil. As soon as you start doing <laughs> self-defense abroad, you're 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 doing an Iraq. You know, you're you're doing an Iraq, right. uh, and that's that's just wrong. Um, but the um, but I believe that they are afraid that Russia might be the next Soviet Union and break apart and be broken apart. I have something. I'll, I'll come back to that, but. but, but <laughs> Because there's there's a there's a debate going on in America right now about that very issue, just from the perspective of do we see that as a positive or a negative? And there's some really irresponsible comments being made, in my opinion, about that that possibility about Russia breaking up or Russia collapsing. But before I get to that, there's this there's this aspect that's been uh, t tough to deal with because there's sort of it seems like on the American side to me, whether it's a portrayal in the media or actually dealing with decision makers and power brokers in Washington, D.C., that no progress can be made in terms of trying to establish a ceasefire, establishing a pathway to peace, something like that, because most Americans have been pushed in media portrayals to they just can't move off of one single ultimate Trump card, which is that, hey, Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, do we really want all these people dying? Do we want it to escalate? Do we want to risk uh, flirting with terms like World War Three and and nuclear strategic uh, strategic nuclear weapon? Uh, no, we don't want to do that. Yeah, but Russia invaded Ukraine, so whatever happens to Russia doesn't matter because it was their fault, mm -hmm. right? We want all these bad things to happen. Well, they should have just left Ukraine alone. And there was this that comment. I'm sure you know it already from last week when Lavrov made the comment that basically America forced us to go into Ukraine. He was in India and the audience like just laughed at him and said, get real or get serious. One of the problems and my background obviously with Russia is very intense and very tight. And, and I do indeed have a lot of affinity for Russian cultural things. It's quite, quite a rich and amazing country and history and, 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 and personality as a state. But there is one thing they're bad at in in this situation, if I can be completely honest, is they can make correct, the Russians can make correct points, but they can are absolutely horrible at trying to explain them to Western audiences. They're bad at selling them. Right. They're like, really, America is like, America's much better at sales. Like that's like, so when this Indian audience and international audience in India almost tries to laugh Lavrov off the stage, Lavrov was not being a propagandist when he said, we were pushed into Ukraine. He was he he can pinpoint definitive foreign policy moves over the last decade, if not decade and a half, that made the Russians feel a year ago that we really have to do this to send the message that no one has listened to us about for for ten to fifteen years. That's sort of what he's saying. But instead, everyone interpreted that as Lavrov saying, "Look, we're this peace loving. We didn't have anything to do with this. They forced us to go in." And everyone just laughs at it. And I wish he had the ability to try to compete with that, but they do not. I'm not I have to rewatch this clip. I know what clip you're talking about. And I interpreted the laughter of the Indians as approval, as in uh, yeah, that's 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 what it, it is. Just, I have to I have to rewatch that. Maybe I missed it. It would be it. I hope you're right. I, I I am not, but part of it could be my own the influence of my own media here in the West, because mm -hmm. I can get you how that incident was covered by the West. Mm -hmm. It's been percent all about the Indians laughing Lavrov off of, off the stage. In other words, he's a joke. What an idiot! Blah blah I, blah. That's how we portrayed it. 
I, I, ha I have to rewatch that because, you know, the Indians are, I should, in my view, are prone to understand that uh, there is a double standard going on, especially in the in the narrative of the West. You know, you can at the same time say, like, um, Russia needs to get it, uh, all its boots out of Ukraine, including Crimea. This is an ego occupation and simultaneously say we are um, protecting peace and security in uh, northern Syria, where we have our troops and we right. make sure that the oil is secure, you know, as Mr. Trump, Donald Trump said, and, and, and we keep it secure. And we are intervening around the world militarily wherever we want. And that's bringing peace and stability. Uh, when Russia has boots on the ground, it's an it's an evil empire that tries to, uh, to overextend itself. And I think this this double standard, at least in the developing world and uh, well, in, well, in India and, and uh, also in, in South America and in Africa, it has been increasingly clear. I mean, the South African foreign um, minister, she she actually pushed this back very hard against uh, mm. against Anthony Blinken uh, when he tries to say, like, hey, you are you either with us or against us. And then she's like, no, right. we are we're going to continue our positive relationship with Russia because, yeah, we are not a, we are not happy with what they're doing, but you're doing the same. Right. And in, right now, I can honestly say, after basically an entire year of, uh, and I don't mean this as a, in any kind of emotional way at all, but it was, the American position has been basically anti-Russian for the entire year, mm -hmm. in the sense of it, it does not consider any of the Russian complaints or criticisms that they say led up to this war, as we do not consider them legitimate, we do not give them any real attention, we are not willing to give them any legitimacy. Uh, there's the only people now, just now, uh, there are some politicians who are starting to talk about the insane support for the war in Ukraine. It's ridiculous how where this is continuing. How long are we going to do it? And they're looking at it from a cost analysis. But those people tend to be right now in the United States, ironically, really, really far off to the right of our spectrum. So mm -hmm. they're incredibly right-leaning Republicans. Yeah, and Marjorie moment, Taylor Greene. Uh, right. The far-leaning right side of the Republican Party right now, to be completely honest, is not looked at by most, by a, by a huge portion of America as being uh, very subtle or nuanced or refined in their argumentation. So it doesn't help that at the moment, the only time you're going to hear any kind of argumentation in the United States for, wh when are we going to try and actually end this war? When are we going to try to create some kind of movement for peace between the sides involved and negotiate some kind of settlement? It's coming from politically sort of yeah. illegitimate or sort of dismissed characters. And that, but, that's that's been that's been difficult to deal with. Yeah, but you know, we have we have seen this in Europe too. I mean, it has been mind-boggling that the that the pro-peace faction moved from the left into the right. In Germany, the same thing. The AFD. The AFD is the one that the, the right, the, the, all not neo-Nazi, but the very right-wing uh, yeah. uh, anti-immigrant and so on. Those are the, the that group is the one that pushes for it. And and on the left, you have like the very left uh, uh, politicians, and they are now rallying to together to kind of say we need to push for diplomacy. And the entire establishment left and, and center parties, they're all laughing it off, saying, ah, this is is nonsense. It's naive to believe that the Russians would want peace. They will just continue. And they completely, utterly ignore that Russia for eight years tried to solve this war diplomatically, eight long years. And uh, we know now that it was uh, Merkel and Hollande and Poroshenko who all said the Minsk agreements were never meant serious. They always were meant to buy us time to then uh, have weapons. <laughs> and, right. and that those eight years are completely being eradicated from our public discourse. And I don't understand that. I, uh, well, I mean, I well, don't understand how it happens that, that, that this for... all gets deleted for the americans for the americans it's easy because i can i can extend my there's a corollary to extend back the eight years because again americans who are so inclined can say yeah but eight years ago russia invaded crimea so we don't want to hear about anything about peace because russia started this and physically they invaded and took something so it's their fault so whatever befalls them is their problem the only movement i will say to be fair the only movement I've started to see, and this is really literally only in the last last few weeks in, in America, is people have started to try to push um, the fact that this last year in Ukraine, as far as the financial outlay, 
of materiel, of lethal aid, has actually come very close already in one year to equaling the entire lethal aid output that we put into Afghanistan over 20. Mm -hmm. That When you tell people that, and it gives them something they can actually physically check in terms of quantifiable data, so they realize it's not a lie, that is true, and it does at least make Americans stop and go, wait a minute. Now, I know in my American mentality that the global war on terror and hunting down bin Laden and injuring al-Qaeda and then resisting the Taliban and their support for groups like al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, that was a real cause. And so I'm, I've never cri criticized or complained about what we financially put in there mm -hmm. in terms of lethal systems and, and weaponized systems over the course of two decades. But that's a, almost like that was our holy cause, quite frankly, in the 21st century for Americans in terms of foreign policy. That global war on terror in the first 20 years was a big deal. When you tell them that you've spent almost that same amount of money in 12 months to protect the territorial integrity of Ukraine and make sure that a couple of Eastern flanked uh, republics that are full of ethnic Russians don't get taken over by Russia, that at least has started to make some Americans go like, these, these two things shouldn't be equal. <laughs> like, yeah. as far as foreign policy objectives, how is it that we're spending, because it makes people finally, my hope, I don't know if they will go there, but my hope is that will make people finally start to wonder, well, is that our goal? What is the goal of the United States in providing all of this lethal aid, all of this milita militarized support, is it really to just to protect the eastern flank of Ukraine? Do we really believe it's an attempt by Russia to reestablish the Soviet Union when I've I've written and spoken for probably nearly two decades that the evidence, I'm sorry, just really doesn't support that as a true objective of the Russian Federation, that they intend to retake all of Eastern Europe and reformulate some type of Soviet Union slash Eastern Bloc. So if that's not true and they and Americans won't believe that protecting the eastern part of Ukraine is a worthwhile goal for that much money and for that much sacrifice, what is the goal? What is the goal of the United States in doing what it's doing? And, and that's, when thing, that's when the conversation starts to turn really, really interesting and makes a lot of people start to get a little uncomfortable in good ways, in yeah. thinking thoughts and new, new perspectives. That's that's definitely a good thing. I have my. Uh, I, I wonder how you can have such a view about the Russian goals again when you look at the eight years that this conflict has been going on for eight years. Russia hasn't tried to absorb these these uh, Lugansk and Donetsk. It hasn't tried to build anything like like to 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 extend its hegemony. Uh, you know, people then often quote, "Oh, two thousand and eight, Georgia." Like we know, it was one of my country women, you know, like Heidi Tagliavini. Mm -hmm. The Tagliavini who had a report said, like, no, the first shots back in two thousand eight were fired by um, by Georgia, and then everything escalated. And yes, uh, Russia did support these these other breakaway regions, but God damn it, these are highly complex issues that involve that are more akin to the Yugoslav wars, you know, with very tightly knit uh, 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 ethnic groups that intertwine, and then uh, and then you've got these problems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Ukraine too. I mean, it's uh, Ukraine itself is a highly complex state with its with its ethni ethnicities, and it, it's a it was a powder keg. It, it is and was a powder keg, mm -hmm. and it stayed together in the 1990s. Luckily, because it was managed very responsibly. Um, but let me ask you then, in like what let you me, said. Let me just quickly let me just yeah. quickly add right there before your next yeah. question. Sorry, is that I think what the evidence shows, and I can even go back to in in the aughts with Estonia. With, with the cyber incursions with Estonia, if you look at Abkhazia, if you look at Georgia, if you look at Crimea, if you now look at Eastern Ukraine, you actually see the evidence of military maneuvers that clearly indicate that Russia is more interested, at least in the 21st century, is much more interested in, in sending symbolic messages of understand who your dominant neighbor is in this neighborhood and pay us the proper respect and things will be all right. But if you don't do that, or if you flirt with outside external powers who will cause us to feel insecure and cause us to feel threatened with our own security, 
then we'll make we'll make maneuvers to remind you of who the dominant power in the regional neighborhood is. That is a far cry from saying, I wish to reestablish the Soviet Union. A very far cry, a very far cry. So, so my, my, and that's just been ignored. That's been ignored here in the West. I, um, anyone who says Russia has legitimate security concerns these days is being like gets his finger pointed at them saying like, oh, are you a Russian stooge or do you believe their propaganda? The Russians don't have security concerns. They're lying. Everything they're saying is lies. And that then gives those people who do not who want to solve this conflict with weapons and with a with a, vi a complete victory, including Crimea, that gives them the um, well, they're they're in, all of their of their narrative narrative force saying like the Russians don't want the Russians do not want to discuss. Therefore, the only language they understand is weapons, and we have to speak that language. That's the narrative coming, right? Well, I, I think that's true, but only in that people are talking this way, I, I find is true. But but the reality is the real change in the narrative happened with the emergence of a powerful, successful defense. Well, it's always gone back and forth in the last year, to be honest, between Russian side and Ukrainian side. But the idea, like Zelensky certainly one year ago did not think he would ever operate from a position of strength and making demands, mm. right? to where now he's sitting there and saying, look, the Ukrainian position for negotiations is leave the country, give us everything we consider ours back, including Crimea, and we'll, then we'll consider the war over. But that's not actually, for, for those like you and I who study diplomacy and negotiate and conflict, that's not really how negotiations are when it comes to ending a war. No. Very rarely do you end a war in the modern day by saying, Okay, one side is going to take 100% of the loss, and the other side is going to take 100% of the victory, and both sides will be happy with that. Yeah, and you know, I have a hard time to believe anything that either that that comes from the podiums, you know, from like either Zelensky or the White House, because we know how much public public uh, uh, how much propaganda this is in order to to make their domestic audiences for their domestic audience, you know, the victory speeches. We are just one week away from complete victory. We know that. And you remember <laughs> Afghanistan, how how um, everybody believed, oh, the Afghans will put up a fight at least a year or so against the Taliban, and they were overrun in like three days. Uh, right. Once, w like once things start to collapse, they they can collapse quickly, and all of the facade might come down uh, soon. But that's There's... also true for on the Russian side. I mean, the, the, the smoke screen, the smoke screen is very very thick on all sides. <laughs>